what does it mean to be human today? To be human today is to be responsible either directly or indirectly for climate change, for extinction of species, poison in the food chain, war, terrorism, cyber hacking, biological warfare. This means extinction. This means extinction. And it also means insanity. So if we do not agree that the world is insane, then we are declaring our insanity. So that's where I am. The world is insane. I've accepted that and I'm at peace. Welcome. My guest today needs no introduction, but I'm going to give you one anyway, because I have my own special story to tell you. In 1992, I published my first book. It was called A Return to Love. And while I was writing the book, I read uh, a book by someone I had never read before. I had never heard of this author before. He was a doctor, and he talked about how when he was in medical school, they were experimenting with rabbits, and I don't know, something with rabbits. And the medical students started cuddling the rabbits and just stroking them and stuff because they were so cute. And he found uh, the extraordinary physical changes that occurred in terms of the health of the rabbits. So I thought that this was so in line with everything I was talking about and writing about and return to love. So I spoke of this author, I spoke of this book, I spoke of this experiment, his name, Deepak Chopra. And I remember thinking the name was kind of odd because I'd never heard the, <laughs> that name before. I even remember when my friend Ariel Ford, uh, who used to come to my lectures in those days, said, I'm going to call him and tell him I'm going to sell his cassette tapes. Those were the days when all of us had these little cassette tapes of our lectures. So I've known Deepak for a while. In 1992 to now, I've known him about 30 years. And... Um, what an honor it has been to know him, to, to learn from him. I'm an avid reader of his books, and um, I love him like we all do. So I'm so grateful to have him on to the show today with me to talk about not only his newest book, Metahuman, but to talk about anything that he wants to talk about, because that's always how I feel about Deepak. What's going on for you, Deepak? Because whatever it is, when you talk about it, we all learn. And he told me that uh, what he's most interested in is talking about where he is in his life today. He even asked me, he said, hey, Marianne, you want to start a new political party about love in action? So he's obviously got a lot on his mind, just like we have a lot on ours. It's such an honor to be able to talk to him. My friend, my colleague, someone that I'm sure makes all of us grateful to be able to read his words and learn from him, Deepak Chopra. My old friend Deepak Chopra, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love you so much. I'm always thrilled to be uh, finding an excuse to be with you and talk to you. I love you too. And I love everything that you've done for the world. And I think that I'm not the only person who's very curious about your view of things today. Uh, your latest book is called Metahuman. And you talk about the extraordinary journey of just being alive. You, there's a line you say that I love. You say, just knowing what had to happen for a human being to be born, we should be perpetually amazed. We should be perpetually surprised. And you talk in that book about the journey from birth, not only to where we are, but where we could be as humans. So I want to start by asking you where you are as a human being and where you think humanity is and where you think all of us could be going now. Okay, so uh, because I'm with you and because um, I'm no longer in need of validation by other people, I can be totally transparent with you and totally honest with you. So even though I seem to be very popular in this culture, writing books, 95, whatever, um, you know, I'm still a traditionalist. You can't help your upbringing. Um, you know, what you learn from your parents, from your mother, your father, your culture. Mm -hmm. So in the tradition I come from, Marianne, there are four ashramas of life. And ashram literally means, actually there's a Jewish word, which is very similar, ashiram. Mm -hmm. Ashiram is the place you rest in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are four ashirams or ashramas. Um, for a human life. 
The first 25 years is education. The second 25 years, um, long gone, is fame and fortune. The third is giving back. So I am now 74, October, I'll be 75. So I entered the final ashram. And the final ashram is supposed to be self-realization, finding out who you are beyond the human identity you've assumed. And that should happen before death. It's also called awakening. And uh, I'm experiencing that now. And so I'm happy about that. I, I have joy without a reason. Honestly, I do not believe, I think the pursuit of happiness is an oxymoron because it assumes that you're unhappy. Therefore, you have to pursue it. I also fi find uh, the phrase peace of mind an oxymoron because the mind is never at peace. So I have given up those concepts. I'm purely feeling joyful right now. And uh, I have no personal motivation for anything. Even though I enjoy doing these things, podcasts, writing books, all of that. I enjoy because what else to do, right? And I, I, there's so many hours you can meditate. But I do that. I meditate. I practice yoga. I do breathing. I focus on my death, the next chapter. I would like to have the big meditation rather than die of some, you know, people die of illness. I would like to die in meditation in what is called Maha Samadhi. And that makes me very happy. Uh, and so that's where I am personally waking up from this human condition, which has actually caused uh, um, a collective insanity that we are not aware of. So what does it mean to be human today? To be human today is to be responsible either directly or indirectly for climate change, for extinction of species, poison in the food chain, war, terrorism, cyber hacking, biological warfare, this means extinction. This means extinction. And it also means insanity. So if we do not agree that the world is insane, then we are declaring our insanity. So that's where I am. The world is insane. I've accepted that. And I'm at peace. I hear very clearly everything you're saying. I'm a few years behind you. But I was, have been thinking recently about the word mellow. People say you mellow as you age. And I always thought it was a little cliched and trite to say that. But I'm starting to feel the mellowing, which is very similar to what you described. I was talking to a girlfriend, probably someone that you know as well, Kathy Freston. I was at her house in Los Angeles the other day. We were talking. And I said, you know, I used to think that here was life. And then there were these other things you got to do in your downtime, like coming to visit Kathy and just talking. And I said, what I realize now is that this is it. Talking to someone, being real with someone, that is it. That's not peripheral. Just being wherever you are, going as deep as you can into that moment and being honest and transparent and growing and real that is it. There's no place to go. There's nothing to try to achieve. So I do hear you. And I also am happy for you because God knows you've given so much to the world. And I, I know a lot of people are listening to you right now and just smiling and nodding their head. It's, it's not only great that given all that you've achieved, all that you've given, that you should experience this, but also I think it's a model for all of us because I think there's a certain level in which age is the new heart. You know, everybody's like, how do we do this chapter well? But then we I haven't have... seen, by the way, I haven't seen Kathy for 35 years. Give her my love. I will, I will, I will. So then there's the issue that you went to next, which is that the world is insane. And that the world is not only insane, but it is insane on a trajectory of such self-destruction, such increasing self-destruction, a self-destructive trajectory that is increasing in velocity. You have children. I have a child, grandchildren. Uh, I think for people of a certain age, we, you know, we can do the math in our heads and assume, well, you know, maybe I'll make it out before the whole thing blows up, but our children won't or our children's children won't. Um, it's counterintuitive how the older you get, 
even though we feel the, mel the mellowness, we also feel the sense of urgency almost as great as when we were young. So how do you live with that within your heart, knowing that with this race to what could be planetary extinction, your grandchildren, your great, great grandchildren would experience the consequences of all this insanity? So one of the reasons I'm still engaged in these conversations is that uh, I do want uh, my children and my grand, my children are now adults, my grandchildren uh, to live in a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier and joyful world. But having said that, I also am experiencing what we said is called awakening, okay? So given the current scientific model, and not that it's right, but it's what works. You know, we're using Zoom right now because we use these things, iPhones, and everything we do is a gift of science, right? We fly airplanes, we, we use technology. So you say science works. It's a, it's a very uh, good system of thought and it gives us access to reality. Now that's where I differ. And that's where the great wisdom traditions differ. The current scientific model says there are two trillion galaxies, two trillion. Now that's an unfathomable number. We live in the Milky Way galaxy, which is a hundred billion stars. Current science also tells us <clears throat> that there are probably 60 billion habitable planets just in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and how do they say that? They put all these telescopes in the sky, you know, they look for something called the Goldilocks zone, the James Watson telescope, the new ones. Hubble is very old. And so if a planet is very close to its sun, too hot, no life. If it's very far from its sun, too cold, no life as we know it. So it has to be in the Goldilocks zone. And based on that, they say 60 billion planets in just the Milky Way galaxy, 700 sextillion stars out there. Seven, I don't even know how to write that. And if we actually go by the current scientific estimates, then there are trillions of uncountable, possibly habitable planets. Planet Earth is not even a grain of sand in all the beaches of this Earth. On that grain of sand is a human species called Homo sapiens, which means the wise ones. We gave ourselves that name. We have the hubris to say, we know what's going on. We have no idea what's going on. So given that, and given the awakening, you know, we all, we've heard these, sometimes these profound truths are cliches. They become cliches. So, you know, we've all heard Buddha said, life is a dream. You know, Wittgenstein said, um, we are asleep, our life is a dream. Once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we're dreaming. So when you start to wake up enough to know that you're dreaming, then you say, you know, if insects disappeared from this planet, then life would cease in five years. Yeah. If humans disappeared from this planet, life would flourish in five years. We would be back to the Garden of Eden. So wh where is the flaw here? The flaw here is, we don't know what's going on. Zero idea of what's going on. We think we could know what's going on, but even the best of us, you know, I interview Nobel laureates these days for my podcast and this and that. They won Nobel Prize and they won it at the age of 28 or 32. They're digital natives. You ask them, do you read Plato? They never heard of the word Plato, okay? But if this is a dream, which I now totally know it is, because by the time you hear my words, they won't exist, okay? By the time people see this program, what they're seeing, they won't be seeing. They think they're seeing me, but they won't be, okay? And by the time you hear these words, they won't exist. If I asked you what happened to your childhood, it's a dream. If I asked you what happened last year, it's a dream. But if I asked you what happened this morning, it's a dream. If I asked you what happened two seconds ago, it's a dream. So the best we can do right now is to upgrade the dream. So the fictional characters called Mary Ann Williamson, Deepak Chopra, my children, my grandchildren, the fictional characters in this collective dreamscape can upgrade the dream from the nightmare it is right now. And 
Some people like nightmares. The people like to go horror movies. They like to get the heebie-jeebies, as they, we call them. And the more scared they are, the more terrorized they are, the more they enjoy it. And that's what's happened with our world. We are now addicted to a dream that has become a nightmare. So why am I engaged? So let's upgrade the dream. Well, the Course in Miracles actually uses that language. It says we're in a dream that has become a nightmare and that before we can awaken, we must turn this into a happy dream. I like and, that. Yeah, and you talked about how in your own life now, you've achieved a state where this level of self-actualization, transcendence, acceptance has occurred. So from what you're saying, the point is now for us to try to move collectively to that place, that if humanity does not move collectively to that place, the only alternative to that is planetary extinction, right? Right, and knowing you, and also your watching you over the years, mm -hmm. I've seen you slowly, but surely go the same path that I went. I was a very angry peace activist in the 70s. I was a feminist with Gloria Steinem in the 70s. I thought the world was going to change in 10 years. We were all going to see a peaceful, just green peace, peace movement, feminist movement, ecology movement. What happened? We were worse, right? We are worse. So I turned from being an angry activist to what turned out to be a phrase that I embraced a while ago called sacred activism. And I like that word. What means is we engage with passion, but we, I'm not going to entangle my karma with the karma of the insane humanity that I see right now. I will engage, but I will not get entangled, which means I'm now engaging with joyful detachment, but I will help. Well, that's the interface between spirituality and politics, isn't it? Because if we are over attached to the things of this world, we cannot transform them and we can hardly even endure them. But if we can have that dispassionate and yet passionate commitment, uh, it's a dispassionate observance of what's going on, but a passionate commitment to doing what we can, showing up, as you said, not entangled and yet deeply involved and deeply engaged. That takes me back to your book where you seem to indicate and I think all those spiritual traditions would tell us this, that once we do get to that place of the up-leveling of consciousness, that actually anything is possible. Yeah, anything, uh, infinite possibilities avail themselves. If you actually uh, engage in what I now, I'm finding a favorite phrase of mine, love in action, because love without action is irrelevant and action without love is meaningless. But when you engage in love and action, then the whole world supports you. And so right now, even though I may be personally offended by um, um, the, uh, the gross injustices of my fellow human beings, I've decided not to be personally offended anymore because then I can't do anything about it. Then it becomes my issue and it, it's, I'm, you know, I'm back to where I was. So at this moment in my mind, I have accepted that all leaders, all politicians that I know with few exceptions are gangsters, <laughs> they're mafia. They're only interested in their own political career, period. It doesn't matter if they're Democrat, if they're Republican, if they're what. I can name two or three people in the world that I would not consider gangsters or mafia. But there are three in the world, or maybe four, and maybe some that we don't know. So it's time to disengage, for me, with gangsters. But if you wanted to create an independent <laughs> political party, which has only one goal, love in action, I'll be your ally. 
Yeah, that is the first thing you said to me when we came on. Hey, Marianne, you want to start a new political party? Yeah. I said, will you do it with me? <laughs> you push me out in front. You say, well, I'll support you. So let's go back a little bit. You've, you talked about how we basically make that shift from judgment or personal entanglement to observation. And when we reach that level that this is just observation, I just happen to be seeing it the way it is, we get this fierce capacity for radical truth telling which leads you to look at all the, practically all the leaders of the world and say, basically, uh, they're mafia, basically. Yeah, they're you're cunning hypocrites. That's what they are, cunning hypocrites. And that's okay. All self-righteous morality is jealousy with a halo and cunning hypocrisy anyway. Yeah. So, you know, you read the Ten Commandments. How many people follow that, right? Read the yamas and yamas. How many people follow that? But they all talk about it. Right. Well, but this is the deal. You, you talked about love in action, and you talked about the fact that you said when you're at a certain place, the world wants to love you. And I do feel that the majority of people in the world do feel a yearning to love and be loved, and that's really what they would love to do with their lives. But those political systems, uh, systems of power that dominate so much of the collective behavior on the planet, is not love in action. It's the opposite of love and action, which is why you describe it as the work of mafioso, as the work of gangsters. And one of the things that you and I have both seen is how reactive that world gets to the introduction of love into the conversation. Because that is in fact the greatest threat, which is why it becomes so mocked, why it becomes so peripheralized. Where do you sit with that? Do you just... I sit with that, that all I can do is still stay in that loving awareness, still share the light with people like yourself and a few others and not fight the darkness because it's impossible. You know, you cannot fight the darkness. And so you, you stay in loving awareness, you stay with love in action. You hope that the dream will get upgraded. And if it doesn't, so be it. Nature might celebrate. You know, the universe might celebrate. Last extinction was 65 million years ago when a meteorite fell on this planet. And in less than 24 hours, I believe, I might be wrong, but I'm told that it took a very short time for the dominant species to be wiped out. It was bigger than a nuclear bomb. You know, you had these species, dinosaurs. We have no idea how intelligent they were. There were more, many kinds of them. They would span huge distances in, in their wingspan, some this small, some that small, but they ruled this planet, okay? And they're gone. And what emerged is Homo sapiens, we. Maybe it's our time, you know, and nature says, let's upgrade uh, the species. Uh, I don't know. But, you know, if you really think about this seriously, then there's no option, Marianne, than to engage in love in action and loving presence, shine the light and detach. I 100% see that, 100% agree with that. And I'm also reminded that as The Course of Miracles says, miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. So society never changes because a majority wakes up one day and thinks of things differently. A society changes because a small group of people, usually considered outrageous radicals by the status quo of their time, have a better idea. That's how evolution works, the mutation. The, the mutation consciousness is always enough members of a species that have the thought and display the behavior of moving in a different direction than the maladaptive behavior that is uh, leading to the extinction of the species. And why shouldn't the human race evolve? If we up level, as you keep saying, to the love that you speak of, the love in action, then theoretically there will be a miraculous breakthrough. You know, the story I've been thinking about a lot uh, Deepak is the story of Moses and the parting of the Red Sea. That when, they, when the Israelites got to the Red Sea, about that time, Pharaoh decided he wanted his slaves back. So he had sent the, uh, the army to go get the Israelites, either take them back to slavery or kill them. And if they, went, if they turned around, they would meet that 
fate, if they moved forward, they would drown in the sea. And Moses was commanded to actually walk into the water all the way up to his nose. And with his rod, which is that vertical consciousness, it created what scientists now say actually can exist inside the ocean, which is a tunnel formation. So to me, the metaphysical meaning there is that when consciousness reaches a certain place, I love how in The Course in Miracles it says, I assure you time and space are under my control. That the drama that you have described, which would include this species going extinct, and as you pointed out, we're the predator species. So maybe our being gone from this planet is just part of nature's will because we're too dangerous to have around here. We're, you know, like you said, they, we can't live without the insects, but the insects can thrive without us. So one point you're making is that maybe that's just the best way to go. But it seems to me that there's another option as well. And that's that as we do become this metahuman that you're talking about, as symbolized by all the great religious figures and avatars, that not only our behavior, but time and space as we know it will bend to the changes in our behavior and new possibilities could emerge. In your heart, do you feel that's possible? In my heart, I feel that's possible. Let me tell you why though, okay? So I was trained as a scientist okay? and it became my religion too. You know, there's a difference between what we call science and being an apostle of scientism. So science is just a methodology, observation and validation, experiment and or validation or falsification. It's a methodology, mm -hmm. but it's based on two very fundamental flaws. One is that matter is the ontological primitive of the universe. There is something called physical matter, this, this, this body, this uh, computer, that's based on this assumption that there is a substance called physical matter. Now, I'll, I'll share with you why that's not true. That's one flaw of science. The other flaw of science is what we call subject-object split. There's me and there's everything else. But it's not that way. It's, everything is one phenomenon and me is an expression of that phenomenon. So this philosophy of science today that I'm partially attacking with the help of some brilliant scientists is called naive realism. And uh, it's also called, by the way, scientific realism. So the science says the world is real. It's not a dream as the Course in Miracles says. And science says the world is real and it is exactly the way humans perceive it with their five senses. Now, on the face of that, that's ridiculous because you know an insect with a hundred eyes doesn't see the same world that you see. A bat experiences ultrasound. A snake navigates through infrared. So the picture of the world depends on the biological organism observing it. There's no such thing as an objective world. Furthermore, what we call matter is a perceptual activity, which is a modified form of awareness. Now, these days, if you talk to cognitive scientists, they won't use the word soul because that's a religious word, okay? So the soul word is out. They won't use the word God because that's also a religious term. So that's out. But they are now questioning naive realism, some, not all. And, you know, I read a conversation between the great Indian poet Tagore and Einstein. And this was in 1930, before the war. And Einstein was thinking of escaping. Nazi Germany was coming. There was a lot happening in the news. Einstein was a celebrity. He had won the Nobel Prize, theory of relativity, both general and rel uh, special theory. He was dabbling into quantum mechanics. Tagore was senior. And also a Nobel laureate, but nobody knew who he was. You know, he's an Indian guy who wrote poems. And in fact, Bertrand Russell said he went to a lecture with Tagore for Tagore in London. It was the same bullshit about uh, <laughs> consciousness being the ultimate reality. So when they spoke, Einstein said there's the human view of the world and then and the human view, your idealistic consciousness, God view, 
divine view, but there's the scientific view. And, you know, I, Tagore very humbly responded. He said, the scientific view is also that of the human scientist, and it comes from human consciousness. And what you're talking about is naive realism. Uh, in, he didn't use those words, but he said that. And Einstein very gracefully said, but then science is my religion. So he made that distinction that science is his religion. Given that, that there's no subject object split, that nobody has ever proved the existence of a substance called matter, all we have is consciousness experiencing itself as what we call the physical world, given we can't use down the scientific world, uh, God or soul, they've come to a very good compromise. They don't say soul, they say conscious agent. I like that. So you and I are conscious agents. If you want to call the soul a conscious agent, that's fine. And they don't use the word God. They say pure potentiality, infinite possibilities, pure awareness, modifying itself as the experience of the world. I'm good with that because all it means is there's only spirit, nothing else. The mind is an artifact. The physical world is an artifact. The physical body is an artifact. These are good human constructs, just like Wall Street is a human construct or money is a human construct, or Greenwich Mean Time is a human construct. Why not Botswana Mean Time? We just made these things up. We made colonial empires, white supremacy. Now it's coming back as Black Lives Matter. It's all because of a mistake of perception. Once you correct the mistake of perception, I don't care whether we call it God, soul, infinite consciousness, whatever. But once you wake up to that, then what you're calling miracles is existence itself is a miracle. Yeah, there yeah. is no explanation for existence. Zero. Yeah. Zero. So the rest is all made up. Now we can use words God, spirit, etc. But if this moment is not a miracle, then nothing is a miracle. Absolutely. Miracles are, are miracles of the natural order of the universe. That's it. And when they do not occur, it's because the human mind has messed with things. That's, That's it. Uh, certainly what we were saying. The, you keep saying you don't care that um, those who speak in terms of pure potentiality and consciousness and the consciousness agent, you don't care that they are not okay with the word spirit, that they're not okay with the word soul, that they're not okay with the word God. The reason I do care is because the prejudice against it is used to leave certain voices out of the conversation that I believe contribute to it greatly. People who do think exactly as you're saying, who realize that to see the world uh, only in terms of our physical senses, to not be willing to extend our perception beyond what the physical senses perceive to what the heart knows to be true, is not a sophisticated uh, way of looking at the world. It's actually a naive way of looking at the world, as you're saying, scientific realism. And yet I believe some of the most sophisticated thinking is, like you said, Tagore was as sophisticated as Einstein was. So those speaking in terms of spiritual matters are not naive, we're not stupid. It's, like we, it's not like we don't get that time and space exist. It's not like we don't get that matter, the three dimensions is here, but it's like Einstein himself said, it's still in a, time and space, he said, it's still an illusion of consciousness albeit a persistent one. Yeah, so, sure so this evolution that you talk about into the state of transcendence, into the state of the metahuman, seems to me the only, the, the only survivable option for the human race is for us to realize that locked within this perceptual mechanism, it is like a prison where, where it is almost... Um, inevitable that we will create these horrifying dysfunctions like war, white supremacy, violence of the planet, et cetera, that our liberation from this perceptual prison is absolutely necessary if we are to, once again, part the Red Seas, make that breakthrough into a world on the other side of it. I agree. I didn't mean I don't care in that, uh, you know, I, I'm indifferent. What I'm saying is that, you know, as our vocabulary starts to yeah. be understood by you know those who are militant atheists self-professed militant yeah. atheists yeah. as our vocabulary expands we can begin to have a conversation about naive realism scientific realism mm -hmm. the fact that science is a useful methodology but it does not access the truth right. 
Right. And these, these um, militants, almost fundamentalist atheists are, um, there's a pseudo intellectualism to it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pseudo intellectual perspective. But it's old fashioned, Marianne. It's yeah, like, so old fashioned. <laughs> that, that's what kills me. I've had all these people say she's anti science. And I'm like, well, you're not up with what science is saying today, because what science right. is saying today is in agreement with everything I'm talking about here. As James yeah, Dean they said, are. they just uh, use different words. Yeah, so. yeah. The physicists who say the world, as it turns out, is not the old Newtonian mechanistic model. It is not a big machine. It is, in fact, one big thought. Yeah, and even quantum mechanics is a model. It has nothing to do yeah. with truth. Truth is there's only spirit. There's only the divine. And everything else is a manifestation and also a temporary manifestation. It, does, it flickers in and out at this faster than the speed of light. But, there's know, only God, period. You know what the God is says? love, period. So the Course says, God is love. God is all that is. What is all-encompassing can have no opposite. Therefore, when you think without love, you're actually not thinking, you're hallucinating. Correct. So this whole, whole thing mistake, is one big hallucination. This is the mistake of the intellect, the mistake of the mind. We trust the mind when actually reality is inexplicable, infinite, unexplainable, unimaginable. The only thing you can do is surrender to this divine love and then let go. And when you do let go, you know, when you talk like in your, in your book, in MetaHuman, you talk about all the cells that are, that are present when, when uh, a child is conceived and all the trillions of cells that go into making the body work. So obviously there is an intelligence that knows what it's doing. There is a self-organizing principle. So when we just let it go, we're not letting it go into chaos. Chaos is what happens when we try to grasp it and make it our way. When we surrender and let love be, that's when the nature finds its self-organizing principle. And it seems to me when nature finds its way to self-correct. Self-organizing, self-regulating, self-evolving to higher levels of creativity, vision, transcendence, beauty, love, truth, goodness, harmony, peace is where it's going if we don't interfere. Right. So including taking a moment, be still and know, finding that moment where the universe can self-correct, much like when your car starts to spin out of control, we're all taught, take your hands off the wheel and let it find its natural way. This is, this is reflected in the body with the immune system, that the body can take a large amount of assault and injury and still heal. I think there's an immune system of the mind the psyche can take a lot of assault, heartbreak, et cetera, and still heal. So then the question to me becomes, can't civilization, can't we as a civilization come back from the brink? Can't we as individuals become the immune cells that as we surrender, we surrender into our own, the guidance by which we as individuals will all show up to perform that love in action depending on whatever our skills, whatever our talents, whatever our internal guidance, and that we can pull off that great self-correcting miraculous possibility, maybe not in your lifetime or in my lifetime. And maybe, as you say, maybe if this species goes down, something better will clearly emerge after that. But for the sake of your great-great-grandchildren and mine and the great-great-grandchildren of everybody listening, wouldn't it be beautiful if we could pull that off? Yeah, but again, existence knows how to take care of itself. And existence will take care of itself. And it will evolve if we stay in loving awareness. And the only way we can help is love in action and then surrender to the divine because that's all there is. There's a line in The Course in Miracles that says, it is not up to you what you learn. It is merely up to you whether you learn through joy or through pain. This Course in Miracles is the ultimate truth, honestly. Well, it, and I read it after you spoke about it in your book. Uh, I was not familiar with it. And everything I read was pure joy because it confirmed what my mother had told me when I was a kid growing up. There's one truth spoken in many, many different ways. Yeah, it's yeah. just one truth. And the course is based on universal spiritual themes. It doesn't have any monopoly on truth. Um, 
but it, I always say it's God for smart people. I mean, it really is. Like you were, you were talking about, about how we should walk around being per, uh, perpetually amazed at, at what life is presenting. Yeah. And that's how I feel about all the great uh, religious and spiritual traditions that we- that, By the way, that came from Tagore too. He said that I exist is a perpetual surprise. And if you're not surprised every moment that you exist, your humanity is incomplete. That's what he said. And took, you know, Rumi, our favorite guy, says, why do you stay in prison when the door is wide open? And uh, the fact is we've been bamboozled by the superstition of matter. You were talking at the beginning of our conversation about those four phases of life. You said mm -hmm. there's education and then there's what a fame, fame, and fame and fortune and giving back and then transcendence. It seems to me that it's those two in the middle where people get most locked into the prison. I always say the, the coolest people to talk to are either older or younger. It's people in the middle. You know, when you're after the fame and fortune that you get the most locked into this prison of this is all there is. And so there's something wonderful about aging out of all that. And just kind of refinding the awe that you had when you were a child. Yeah, all you have to do is watch a baby or a child is happy for no reason. It's right. bliss and it's happy for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> then we give it a name. You say you're male, you're female, you're transgender, you're this, you're non-binary. The poor kid is screwed for the rest of his life. <laughs> well, we do a number on children and I'm afraid that we're doing more of a number on children today. Things seem to be going backwards, it seems to me. It's like we're living in two parallel universes. There's this devolutionary cycle and this evolutionary cycle happening at the same time. Everything that you've ever taught me and so many millions of other people is how to participate, co-create, not only take this ride, but be present while we're on the ride. And uh, I've seen you at various times. I mean, all of us who read your books, but all also those of us who have the good fortune of knowing you personally, you're very transparent about your processes, mm -hmm. or at least you have been in the last few years. I am. And uh, we have watched you go through some dark moods. Yes, I've been through the dark night of the soul. I know, and to see, all of that. And to see you now emerge and say, almost, hey, let's party and enjoy every moment is not only wonderful to see because I'm happy for you, but it's also very inspiring, Deepak. And uh, I've never wanted to uh, model more the consciousness and the behavior that you display. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you. And consider me your ally in case you want to start this new party, Love in Action. <laughs> love in Action Political. I may ask you in the near future to help some people right now in a global way. You know, right now, suicide is the number two cause of death in teenagers. What a shame in on us that our children Suicide is the second most common cause. Every 40 seconds, somebody is dying. Last year, more people died of suicide than of COVID-19 in, in, um, in Japan. And we're not paying attention. So at some point, I might want your help in spreading the word on love in action and how we owe it to our children and their children to help at least to some extent that we can help reach that critical mass for a, or not critical mass, just as you said, a few people who are aligned and really are the example themselves of a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier and joyful world. So I might ask you to participate in a couple of uh, talks uh, and you can help me out in that. I've known you for many years. You have never not said yes when I've asked you to help me, including in my presidential campaign. and. Uh, I hope you feel it's been true. It certainly is true now and will be true forever. You call me, you ask me to do anything. I'll I be will. there. I much will. love to you. I love you. Love Thank you, you so much. Thank I love you too. Love God you too. bless you, honey. God bless. That was my conversation with the inimitable Deepak Chopra. Um, you, like me, might want to listen to that interview two or three times. Um, I, I, I was really exhilarated listening to him. And... Um, as usual, it leaves me just wanting more. 
And now we're going to uh, go into our Ask Marianne Anything uh, section. I have three questions here, which I thought were interesting. So let's go right at it. The first one from Sila says, how do I answer my calling as a healer while working my full-time government job? Well, see that your job as a healer isn't separate from anything else you do, including a full-time government job. Our work as a healer doesn't just have to do with what we do. It has to do with who we are. So your full-time government job is a ministry, just like any job is a ministry. When you see it as a way that you can extend your love, your excellence, your participation in something that brings value to the world. I'm sure that in your full-time government job, you're working with other people. Right there, your work as a healer is exemplified. So don't think of your quote-unquote full-time government job as not a healing ministry, but if you were a yoga teacher or something else, that you would be uh, doing the work of a spiritual healer. Wake up every morning, no matter what you do. And when you say, dear God, or the God of your understanding, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say and to whom? You could be in line at the DMV. You could be um, at a traffic light. You could be engaged in any possible activity. And if your mind is used in the direction of sending love to those around you, um, trying to inhabit the space of this moment in whatever way you can, to contribute, you're a spiritual healer. I hope that's a value to you. The next question I have is from Francis, who says, is letting toxic people go unspiritual? Well, we're living in a moment where it's considered very cool to accuse everybody of everything. So notice how everybody's talking about other people being toxic, other people being narcissists, other people being sociopaths. You know, sometimes you might want to ask yourself, what, are they, what is somebody else saying about me when they're talking to their therapist? So I think this issue of toxic people needs to transition to a conversation about toxic relationships. You can be in a toxic relationship. It's not that the person, I don't think we have to, to have that attack thought, they are a toxic person any more than you are a toxic person. Sometimes two people who are just doing what they can in life, but being triggered like all people are triggered and wounded like all people are wounded might come together in such a way that the relationship is toxic. Not like you're toxic or they're toxic, not necessarily. The vast majority of these cases, it's just that the coming together is toxic because this person is wounded, this person is wounded, and the two people, instead of allowing themselves to experience the real spiritual opportunity where the relationship is a place where the, relation, the wounds become healed, instead it becomes a place where one person's wounds rubs up against another person's wounds. They trigger each other instead of healing each other in the way that compassion and forgiveness would do. We call that a toxic relationship. Now, what about letting them go? There are times when physical proximity serves the healing, even in a difficult relationship. Sometimes the issue is to just stay in there and work it out. Sometimes physical proximity doesn't serve anymore. Sometimes Staying in there doesn't help. Which is it? Well, there's no guidebook except that which is written on your own heart. So sometimes you feel like, no, I got to stay in there. I got to try. We have to have another conversation. We have to keep seeing each other. And other times, you know in your heart, it doesn't serve. Now, the Course in Miracles does say that all who meet will someday meet again until the relationship becomes holy. So you always want to be open to the fact that someday we'll circle back around to each other. Now, we're not, you know, we're not talking serious, violent people or anything like that here. We're talking about the purview of normal human relationship, which certainly does include toxic relationships. But the fact that I forgive you and that even that I love you doesn't necessarily mean we have to have lunch yet. So the answer is, is letting go toxic people, unspiritual. Once again, toxic relationships is the issue. Is letting go a toxic relationship unspiritual? Not necessarily. Sometimes love says no. 
Okay, one more question, and that is from Lorraine. And Lorraine says, how can we change how politics and corporate interests go hand in hand without revolution and uprising? Well, there does need to be a revolution, a revolution of consciousness, and there does need to be an uprising. And the uprising is political activism, particularly in the form of voting. John F. Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. When you talk about how politics and corporate interests go hand in hand, you're right, Lorraine. We now have a situation, and this has been building up for the last 40 years, where our government has been turned into a system of legalized bribery, where it has become a handmaiden uh, to corporate forces uh, for whom their own short-term uh, profit maximization is paramount. And because of the money that they were able to spend influencing elections, government does their bidding so that governments being responsible for the health and well-being of the, the collective citizenry, that bottom line is in too many cases replaced by government serving the bottom line of profit for corporate interests. There should be an uprising, an uprising of awareness, an uprising of what the hell's going on here on the part of the American people. And it is revolutionary. Love is revolutionary. Some people say, don't use the word revolution, use the word evolution. But you know what? You know, a machine, there's so many revolutions in a machine. You don't have to go immediately into violent revolution. There are nonviolent revolutions, the, the Indian independence movement, civil rights movement, these ideas of revolutionary changes in society. We should not be afraid of that. We want peaceful revolutionary change. That's it. My name is Marianne Williamson. Thank you so much for listening to the Marianne Williamson podcast today. I hope that uh, if you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, and also check us out on YouTube. I want to thank Lauren Selsky, Wendy Zoller, Mike Burns, and Helen Caddis. I hope that uh, what we talked about today is of value to you, and um, I look forward to the next time we meet. All my best. Bye-bye.